go deeper into the knowledge. I want also to take you deeper into the history and roots of every type of uh, disease. It is very uh, important for you because now too many books are out there about the speak about thousand disease and the death, but there are also uh, uh, translations today of the French disease of the German disease of all the things. And you want to know how to navigate in those things, what to take and what to leave and all that. So I'm going to try to give you the background that you can use in order to go and study those different systems. For example, you can ask yourself, well, since I was the one who brought a French disease at you, and then, well, not you, the early 70s, it was another group, but. I brought the French season out to the world of physical season. Why, when we teach biogeometry, we take some aspects only and don't teach the rest? We show you why, why we choose, why we don't do that, why we don't do that. Uh, so, I'm going to go a bit into uh, the different systems here of the I see why. about ancient registries. Now, I'm going to go in each one of those systems in detail. But in general, we have ancient registries here. And in ancient registries, this is, I mean here, the very elaborate uh, science of universal harmonics and of uh, uh, all the laws of nature and everything as they were practiced in the ancient civilization, the ancient civilization, the holistic sciences that come from everything. There was no, nothing called radiesthesia without harmonics or, or, or without the laws of nature, everything. You had really the only perfect holistic system was in the ancient worlds. As it went written down in time, most of the things were kept secret, but there are things that came out and were used in different systems of anesthesia. So we go, for example, uh, afterwards, we go down, and then you find two groups here, for example, in the Roman Empire, the Ogres and the Saints. Uh, you find the Romans were building cities, and then they had to uh, find the paths when they built their roads from one area to another, they had to find the place that had sacred energy, sacred power spots to build a new city, and in order to uh, put their, uh, let's say, their central temple or what all, all the important edifices of the city on sacred power spots and connect them and all that, they, that system was part of planning. There are simple ways that we used to do in the beginning. Uh, for example, they would get, uh, they, they would watch uh, the birds coming and uh, if they circulate around the place, it has good energy. I mean, they come in V, then circle, that means it has good energy, and they continue in a V. If they come in a V shape like that, and then they scatter, and then they go straight, that means that energy there. So you start observing birds, and then you start observing your animals. Some animals would automatically go there, and uh, then you start. Uh, taking, for example, uh, doing certain tests, and they take sheep uh, and they let them uh, stay there for, let's say, a week or something in the area, and then they look at the liver of the sheep or at the meat of the sheep, and if it's very, very smooth, that means you have very good energy here. If it has, if the meat is not very smooth or the river is not very smooth, that means it has bad energy here. Then they can they bring milk and hang it uh, out there and put it in a bottle and then they hang meat and see how it dries. You see. 
Okay, these are all uh, tests that people have used. I mean, we're doing thousands of years even before ancient civilization. They were the primitive tests that done by people. But then we are entering into a city plan where we have to make, to build temples, to build things, and all that. You need more specific analysis of the city. And that's where the ogres and the saints came. Remember when in the courses, when we showed you the picture uh, of St. Ludger in Germany, and we told you that. Uh, with the staff in his hand, and uh, he was carrying the uh, model of a church, and we we're saying the saints are not just people sitting and praying, no, they're people who are actually working with uh, and those sacred energies. So they had, be before the medieval saints, you had the robot, they have the staff in their hand that is like a spiral at the top, like that. It's called the litus, and with that, they have lens that for the different thing and they were specialists at detecting the sacred energies they could detect uh, the waters uh, for example for sacred well and detect uh, the, the good uh, energy lines the grid lines detect the good location that thing so you had grid mapping so you built your temples and all that so part of ancient anesthesia uh, was practice in a simplified form, not like the ancient Egyptians or Sumerians, but in a simplified form by the ogres and saints. Then, from that area, came, you have here, medieval uh, anesthesia, and from ogres and saints you have also, uh, for example, in medieval times, uh, you have the, the Jesuits, to get some of the old knowledge of looking for sacred spots for wells and all the, the Jesuits, but the Jesuits were more into uh, herbal medicine and treatments because the Jesuits would go to, uh, to remote areas like, like Amazon or, or Africa remote there and they would be using herbal medicine to heal people because they were, uh, in the monasteries they were very, very advanced in herbal medicine. But the person goes to a place and it, he doesn't see it's a totally different vegetation. It's nothing like he has studied or he has known or something. He goes to a completely different environment. He sees things in the forests that he has never seen in his life. So he has to be able to find the cures, cure the people. And then the dysthesia was an invaluable tool for the Jesuits. You throw him out in any environment he could actually find the right herb for the right remedy. Because if you go to those tribes down there in Africa, the Amazon, I mean, he becomes, and he has to be better than the medicine man down there, you know, or uh, serve him as a meal. <laughs> so uh, he has to show. So if they have somebody and he's sick and he can't cure them and all that, he has to be able from what he finds around him to find the proper remedies, herbal medicine. So the Jesuits have a very, very advanced system of anesthesia, of herbal medicine, that was in two places. It was with the Jesuits, and in general, it was in the medieval times, it was, uh, it came to Europe in medieval times, all this science of herbal anesthesia from the Arab scientists of the Arab world at that time. They were very, very advanced sculpture and some uh, great scientists like uh, Avicenna, uh, you might have heard the name. He's, I mean, all, all the pharmaceutical companies around the world now have all his books in their libraries. Uh, the name Avicenna, you can look that uh, up on the internet. And uh, those What's interesting uh, there is at that time also, it wasn't only the medieval anesthesia of categorization by color, like you hold your feminine and you measure, categorize things by the color, things like that. No, there was another thing that started at that time also. It was reading the shape of the plant. That 
signatures of plants, the relationship between a plant and an organ. Because things similar in shape to be similar in energy. So also this was a type of anesthesia that developed uh, at the time. Then as we go here, we spoke about Jesuits, herbal medicine, and then we have an area here where you have anesthesia as a main tool in sympathetic magic. Because the ancients had harmonics. So they had a vast science of relationships. From within harmonics, there is an aspect of resonance that when sort of can be taken alone as a part would be uh, called the law of similarities. So, so the law of similarities is that things uh, are similar. You can move your pen, you can find that the thing is similar to that one uh, energetically. So with the law of similarities, you could categorize everything in nature Let's say according to seven boxes in front of you, each one had a different color, and everything in nature will fall into one of the colors. So that means the categorization of everything in the universe. And that is the law of similarities. And, and here, if you get the tarot cards, for example, you will see that the composition of each one of those tarot pages follows the law of similarities. For example, the plant in there would resonate with the metal in there with things like that. So there are books of knowledge hidden in things like the tarot cards. So this with herbal knowledge, law of similarities, and the loss of the original science, it ended up besides uh, I mean, besides the secret work of the Jesuits and the monasteries, it ended up as uh, basically uh, a way herbal medicine was very advanced in the hands of people who started practicing magical potions and things like that. So automatically, people started referring to, first, uh, today, Radicesia has a bad name because it is linked to dowsing, which was the main instrument of sympathetic magic. Now, now uh, just the law of similarities, it has been changed to sympathetic magic. That means everything in, in the box are in sympathetic relationship to each other. And now, in our mind, it's a school of sympathetic magic. And in the Middle Ages, anybody who practiced sympathetic magic was put to the state and killed. So, because if you had a pendulum then, uh, <laughs> you, you know what would happen to you. So, th this is the, the whole school of dowsing. And because also, dowsing with all this was mostly mental dowsing. But when it came to categorization, you could stay here in the seat of uh, a scientific uh, physical dowsing in, in a way because okay they imagined each color but that wouldn't be an, uh, the, 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 the psychic way of, of dowsing it means you're just using uh, a mental scale of colors so although they didn't know it as a mental scale of colors but that was the beginning of some form of scientific uh, way of looking at it which somehow they had lost, which was there in ancient Egypt, but it was lost then. But it was a seed that would later come out with French and German radiesthesia. The seed was there in radiesthesia. So after that, you see, we have from sympathetic magic, you have, comes out of this, this therapeutic radiesthesia. It was very much not come from there because they were doing herbal things in herbal medicine. So it was used for healing 
with have heard the remedies, and then we have uh, at with the medieval that we see a very important thing that was done also by the Ogles and Saints, and then uh, it was lost in Europe when the Arab world came back from the Arab world in the Renaissance to Europe as water uh, detection, and this was part of the Ogles' work and the Saints' work. Besides detecting the engines for the city, he had to do some uh, water dowsing to detect the sacred well. Because not every sacred flower spot had the, the, the stream visible so that you could uh, detect it on top of the ground. Sometimes some of the sacred flower spots had the streams uh, underground and you would have to detect it and dig for it. But most of them were. You, you had overground, that time, the sacred scene, but they had to detect it. And uh, then we have, we come to more modern era, and we have here German radiesthesia, then we have French radiesthesia, and on the side which still didn't come in from the ancient radiesthesia, on the side was always universal harmonics, it was people like scientists, like I mean Pythagoras, uh, Kepler, uh, even Newton, and things like that, were studying uh, harmonics, but it never really came into uh, the awareness of, of, of anybody, of any scholars, and all that. It was always something on the side. Some scientists studied even uh, when Newton, he, he would study it a bit and then it would fall out again. And it just didn't come out in mainstream until Johann Kaiser came and wrote his books about harmonics. So until the 1940s, universal harmonics was somehow in the background of it. There was always parts of the history everywhere, but it didn't emerge until Johann Kaiser really wrote it in. Now, German and French had season. When we wrote universal harmonics and architecture with it, here we managed to start the physics of quality. Because without universal harmonics, there's no, that concept of quality didn't exist. I mean, although it is there, so the essence of everything, synthetic magic is what? Just don't call it magic and don't call it uh, law of similarities. If you would say, if you knew harmonics well, and the notes, they have a qualitative effect on you. So all those are qualitative, all the disease is qualitative, but somehow something is so obvious and people miss it. And when you miss it, that's where all the problems come. And so come at the end comes my joint. So I'll go through each, some of those in more detail. What, when we have ancient radiesthesia, what, do we, what did it give us? The important things to study in ancient Thermistis are energy of shape. Of course, they were so advanced. Just look at the ancient monuments, look at the pyramids and all that. Yeah. If I manage to give you today, in 40 years of research, science of biogeometry, then imagine if somebody researched something like this for 4,000 years, what he would give you. I mean, I wouldn't even qualify as a student there. Really, I mean, they, they would be so advanced. Now, they, also what they gave us is sacred energy quality to harmonize every action. And that's very, very important. Because in ancient times, like I told you yesterday, you had to live within the mind of divinity. You had to live within the mind of God. You are part of this universal mind. If you lose this perception, this awareness, you are lost. And it's a very, very important aspect of ancient civilizations, and like you said at the beginning, music, the origin of, of words, of letters, and all that, is that you are part of the universal mind. That is why in their life, everything was a ritual. Everything. I mean, when you said hello to the ritual, when you had the glass in your hand, you had to make a ritual. Everything was done in a certain way 
respecting that because everything had to be any action in which this harmonizing link didn't come into the action was to them incomplete. If you didn't have the hand of God on your shoulder when you were doing an action, then it's never complete. And that is, uh, uh, of course, they didn't use the term God. I mean, they were more uh, in a holistic system of divinity and all that. But it's this concept um, that if you were living in this paradigm, you wouldn't need the word religion. It would mean nothing. You would need the word spirituality. You are here, you are living that. So if somebody comes once from our age, goes back there, and you ask them, you know what religion is, do you believe in God? Do you believe in this? They are in that. I mean, they are living in that. So, this concept wasn't even prevailing there, but it gives us what? It gives us today a paradigm that's very important. And we have different consciousness today. So there's no reason to think that our religions uh, are obsolete for us and we should go back to the ancient religions. No, the right thing is to say, with our present state of consciousness, our religions are very good, I have a foot in them, but I have to enrich them with all the knowledge of being in harmony with the universe, and all of a sudden, I will discover such beauty in any one of the modern religions, irrelevant which one, such beauty through, because the, when I open the door to the whole universe, so you see, so if you ask me now how I feel about modern religion when I'm so versed in this ancient way of thinking, I tell you, look, I'm more Muslim than all Muslims. I'm more Christian than all Christians. I'm more Jew than all Jews. I'm more Buddhist than all Buddhists. To me, I'm, I'm more of that. Why? Because you bring that holistic thing into it. And that is a very important aspect. I'm stressing on it because, unfortunately, it is one of the things that is hurting us most towards uh, in our present way of life. But that we can learn from the ancient uh, civilization. So, uh, like you said, how do you with laws of nature? Then the sacred passports on earth and the sky. Look at even the native culture here. The native culture here, uh, they had a very, very strong culture that has to do with sacred passports. But where is it today? The young come out, and they even have forgotten their own languages because they went to those residential schools and all that. And then they even don't want to hear about those things. These are all, you know, things, all grandfather's deeds and all that. But if they knew that this would be the only thing that would give them a better future, they'd understand the value of that. So sacred passports on earth and on the sky. This is again what you see in the ancient ones. This is the ancient they give us. Uh, and then you have sacred architecture and city planning that comes also from the ancient. They were very advanced in that. And, that. and everything was based on the system of universal harmonics. So that is what you get from there. Now, let's look what are the pros and cons like this. We have very advanced comprehensive science quality. The bridge, science and spirituality. This is a very important point. Any modern science that cannot bridge science with spirituality will not help us in our future. So, but the cons are that the secret temple sciences are lost. So, for example, the, the, all the Greek philosophers who learned in Egypt at the end. They were not there when we really when the temple senses were very advanced, but they came out like that beggars, and he could he could only divulge some quantitative aspects. Never speak about the real secrets, although we had studied them. 
countries. And there's many stories about uh, them taking one of his followers of his inner group and trying to get out of them what are they studying. I mean, with him, what, what does Pythagoras know that he's not giving us? What did he learn there? And that person cut his own tongue so that he wouldn't be tortured into divulging the secrets. See, now you can understand that Pythagoras was under oath in the Egyptian temples and he couldn't divulge the secrets. So this secrecy of knowledge for us today is a negative factor because the, the science was lost to us. Unfortunately, you see, if, if, if those things were made open, but then you would think if they were made open anyhow, they, uh, all those people would have been persecuted and killed. So it, it's a situation that seems right at the moment, but for us it's, it's a con controversial thing for us. We, it's lost for us. Uh, like I said, sometimes very dangerous for the uninitiated. That was the reason that it was kept in secret societies. But Today, what it is kept in secret societies is it's not really dangerous for the uninitiated because all the secret societies are looking at the ancient knowledge today. They don't have it anyhow. They're looking at it from the symbolical aspect, from the modern symbolical way of interpreting. So there's no danger. They can't use it in anything anyhow. When it's only symbolic, you're thinking of a paradigm that has nothing to do with the practical paradigm from those times. But that's another problem here. And the other problem that only degraded magical applications survived with the population, and that gave bad name to anesthesia and things like that, and bad name to all types of esoteric sciences and magic and all that, was degraded to something harmful, something bad. So while we have Many pros from the ancient civilization, and are also today some comes here. Now, the medieval great mapping gave us the sacred wonders, the sacred wonders, spiritual context was still there. Because the saints, when they were building the churches and all that, they were not just looking for great lines for health and all that, no, they were looking to have a sacred past or some old history. The whole Practical spiritual aspect was still there. Now, here in the medieval anesthesia, you have the law of similarities, similarities of shape, plant signatures, categorization of subtle energy effects, color scales, sympathetic magic. These are the things that medieval anesthesia gives alchemy and herbal medicine. Pros, herbal medicine that was came to us from the Arabs and the Jesuits and sacred monument traditions to in a very very simplified form but you will see lots of the alchemical secrets and uh, those traditions in many of the churches in Europe of the old churches in Europe although unfortunately most of those things there are parts I mean the, the grid line thing and doing the, uh, the right proportion, placing uh, the columns on the crossings, everything is there in those churches. Then in the symbolism of the churches, some of it has, is more symbolic than actually energy aspects because the science behind it is lost. But it is still, if you go to a place like Chartres in France or something like that, you will see a very advanced uh, spiritual knowledge there. Well, the, unfortunately, the secret taxes and all the ancient books and all that were guarded in the monasteries. Many books that they found in your house, would, you'd end up on the stake for it, were part of the library in the monastery and uh, they were studying it there. But they couldn't, it didn't go out to the people. So this is another thing that the uh, knowledge wasn't available here. Why they? Of course, they had the reason. Not not everybody was wrong, but if you find 
those people practicing magic every day and doing potions and harming others and doing like that, I mean, you wouldn't put all those uh, treasures of books in their hands because their mentality is wrong to begin with. Their mentality is they want to gain money t uh, to do things. So, but it comes out that they were secrets, they were guarded, and we don't have them uh, today. If you go uh, in Egypt, for example, the monastic tradition started in Egypt at the beginning of Christianity. Just in the early hundred years of Christianity was the first monastery. The fir first monastery was, there was no monastic tradition at the time, there was no real church and everything. So the first monastery was, uh, you, you know, when the Romans uh, persecuted the Christians before Christianity became official or accepted by the Romans, in Egypt, we had the two periods. The period when the Romans were persecuting the, the Christians in Egypt, and that uh, is for about a hundred years, the first hundred years. We call that in Egypt uh, the age of the martyrs. So uh, that's in the beginning. So what happened? All the Christians, they fled from the, from the Romans, uh, who were uh, in Jerusalem, in those areas there, they fled. But Egypt was occupied also by the Romans, they came into Egypt. So uh, those people fled, they thought they were in Egypt, they were safe when the Romans occupied Egypt. They went up and hid in the mountains. And until today, if you go up in the mountains uh, in Egypt, you're going to find caves where you have relics of the first Christians in those caves. Now, one of them, Saint Antonius, he gathered a group with him and they made the first monastery in history. And he set a sort of a tradition. So this was the first monastic tradition. And his, one, his disciple, Saint Paul, he went just uh, at a short distance from the first monastery and later on uh, built his monastery there. So we had the uh, first two monasteries on the way from Cairo to the Red Sea, somewhere in the middle there in the mountain ridge between Cairo and the Red Sea. You have those two uh, monasteries. Now if you go to the old churches and old monasteries in Egypt, you're going to find treasures, treasures from those ancient books of knowledge and traditions and all that in the monasteries, but they never leave the monasteries. Not everybody is allowed to go in and has access to those books. And that is in itself one of the problems today, that nobody has access to those books, unless you really know the people, they know uh, you're serious and all that, you have access to them. Then, of course, the we spoke about the medical uh, now French radiesthesia French radiesthesia gave us two systems besides dowsing it gave us mental radiesthesia I mean besides mental radiesthesia it gave us physical radiesthesia so we had dowsing which was mental radiesthesia but we have physical radiesthesia also and physical radiesthesia there the color scales that were used before in, in a mental way became actually scales of uh, physical uh, radiesthesia. They were not invented by physical radiesthesia. They were actually old scales based on sympathetic uh, magic and low similarities. So that is uh, how the French radiesthesia developed. And they have a huge amount of research. The school of radiesthesia has a huge amount of research in France. It's a very valuable school. I started uh, radiesthesia. My first introduction to radiesthesia was through French radiesthesia. But one must remember uh, the, the, the essence, the origin here. The origin lies in the law of similarities in sympathetic magic. And Here, you see, 
This is a very important thing. In every type of radiesthesia, you have a mental component. So in French, radiesthesia differentiates, and they say mental radiesthesia and physical radiesthesia. Some people say it, and that they told me in France in the beginning why the, the whole system of uh, Jean-Marie Berizal uh, and all the others, Turin, all those, why it didn't continue afterwards with the dowsers, why it wasn't popular with the dowsers, and why did they say it, it never worked properly, it doesn't work properly. Uh, the reason they, they said that is, you see, that there is always a mental aspect, even in physical radiesthesia. So th they tell you, why do you call it physical if a large part of it is mental? Now, th this is a very tricky question. What is the physical part and what's the mental part? Why do I call the mental activity physical radiesthesia? So, first of all, you need to be conscious and to tune into something, an awareness to tune into something. You can't practice radiesthesia. You can't have your body as an instrument resonate with something if you don't tune to it. And tuning is an act, a mental act. Okay, but this is just tuning. It doesn't mean asking questions. It doesn't mean it's just I'm, I'm taking it step by step. Just tuning in is a mental activity. So, okay, now. If I use mental calibration, but I am using, not asking questions, but I am imagining going visually through the colors. It is actually no different from having the physical colors on the table and my pendulum on them. So your visualization can be directed to purely psychic mental aspects where you ask questions and all that, but it can be, you can use, uh, let's say, physical methods visualized mentally. So that's a mental uh, thing in, visual, if you are adjusting your pendulum on a red piece of paper and you're thinking of blue, you might not get the, the right adjustment. So you might have to Concentrate on what you are measuring. If you're doing that, it's already mental activity. Okay, but doesn't mean it's ma it's a mental activity, but it's typical of physical radiesthesia. Now, visualization. Th as I said, you can measure an object or visualize the object you're measuring and measure it. So this is also a mental activity. So, are we getting mixed up now? I mean, so why then divide physical radiesthesia and mental radiesthesia? Well, physical radiesthesia and mental radiesthesia, they have two things in common. The instruments, the dowsing rod and the pendulum. Okay. One of them is called and, uh, the system itself would follow in psychology under, uh, for example, the, the topic of automatisms. You know, automatisms, uh, there's a very good book I, I always re recommend for people who want to understand uh, mental radiesthesia, and that's uh, by Emile Coué. Emile Coué, he's a Canadian uh, psychologist, he wrote a big book like that. It deals with automatism, self-hypnosis, and all that. For example, I can, automatism is uh, programming your body to give you an answer to things. For example, if uh, uh, when something bad is going to happen and by chance my eye twitches. But I make the connection. My eye twitched because it was giving you a warning. That means I have programmed my system to this mental connection. Twitch eye problem. This becomes an automatism in the body. 
Now every time there is a problem coming, your eye will twitch. Or you could say, when I look at food and what's good for me, the little finger will, will twitch like that. If it doesn't twitch, it's not good, so I don't eat. You can program automatisms. And uh, automatisms, he goes from the theories of self-hypnosis and all that into automatisms. And he programs, uh, it's like programming your body. And a pendulum is just another sort of automatism. You start a dialogue with your subconscious and agree on if it turns right, it means yes, if it turns left, it means no, now I'm speaking with my subconscious. So it's another automatism. So you, you could say, do what you want, I mean, uh, uh, no, if it's a no, my ha hair will stand up, uh, uh, if it's a yes, my leg will twitch, you can do whatever automatisms you want, it is still there. But the important thing now, if I want, because this is a valuable tool, mental doubt, it's been used for things that are not valuable, when you can use it, it's a very, very valuable tool to use. And because it's a way of speaking to your subconscious, it's a way of mapping the, le the levels of your subconscious, it's the way of finding the entities, the different entities in your soul. It has fantastic uses, but one has to be serious about it. First of all, you made an agreement with the subconscious. You must know how the subconscious uh, uh, works. You must know, you must study it, you must know uh, how to speak to it, its language. For example, if I hold my pendulum and say, oh, I want, I'm looking at the future, uh, shall I go uh, tonight to the movies or shall I go eat in 131 here? And wait for the pendulum to say yes and no. Now, is the, the subconscious reacting? To, shall I go? Shall I go or not go? Well, this is the first question. Okay. We're not yet at the second variable or third variable. See? Shall I go? Okay, we're at the second the movie. Okay, maybe the movie next week. Yes, but doesn't mean tonight. So the thing is, when interacting with the subconscious, you have to break down the dialogue into one variable per question. And this is a huge pitfall that people fall into when they decide to speak to the subconscious about the future, about the past. It will always get answers about anything because subconscious is taking it step by step. Say, okay, can you tell me about the future of this thing, this thing? It answers yes or no. It's just telling you, I can't tell you or I can't tell you. But it never got to the question to begin with. So, this mental anesthesia is a very valuable tool if you take it seriously. And this is how to, the physical anesthesia is different. Your body here, your energy field reacts to things either gets better or worse. It expands or contracts, gets stronger or weaker. But how do I make a science out of this? It's just yes, no. Okay, but your whole, the whole information age is built on the zero one. So it's, it's not, even if it's a yes, no, it's not a problem. You can build a civilization with that. But yeah, it's just yes, no, it's good enough. I mean, so. Uh, I want to go into, let's say, positive and negative. So I would have something like I adjust my pendulum on a battery to see a positive and negative. And then I, instead of going on a battery, I try it on food. So I'm not anymore into electrical polarity, I'm more into a holistic thing that the Chinese call yin yang, that, that applies to everything. So even to non. Uh, n not just to, to electromagnetism, so now, but it's not enough for me 
well, the Chinese built a civilization on just yin yang. Yes, but it's not enough for me. I want more than that. You know, we're greedy. We want more than that. Well, how about dividing the, the, the positive when the field gets active instead of yes, it's getting more active, or no, it's getting weaker, instead of good for me, not good. How about going into degrees? Degrees of overactivity, degrees of underactivity. So I choose certain scales, and that's when the color scales come in. But all those are so that the instrument in my hand is designed to resonate with the type of energy that my body is feeling so I can have an indication. So that is basically what physical radiesthesia. To understand the instrument in your hand, to understand physical radiesthesia, you really, because you have to understand what scales am I working with. I'm measuring quantitative things, but is it really quantitative? Because the body, so I ask, how did the body react? The, the body reacts qualitatively. I mean, you pluck a string, a wavelength comes out. The sound, the note, is the effect on you that the brain gives you the sound. Or the color is the same thing. So if I'm using scales to see what the body is seeing, they have to be qualitative scales. They cannot be quantitative scales. So. Even, I mean, Marie-Louise from France, I think I told her that many times when she studied numbers, uh, that's uh, Marie-Louise from France ran the Jungian Institute after Jung. And she said that numbers are a psychic expression. It's just like seeing colors, like seeing things. The ability to quantify, that means you have a, a sort of a qualitative effect but you have a system li like it chooses colors, it chooses sounds, it chooses quantification. There's no indication that if you put uh, seven oranges here and three oranges there, that uh, a cat will say, will see them as three and seven. Might see them just as a big pile and a small pile, might not. We see the big one, we want to go deeper, so we quantify it, so we give it, we can go deeper into it and start counting in there. So, only if you understand this will you understand the secrets behind numbers in ancient scriptures and the ancient times. When they put numbers before things, uh, people try to understand, yes, but for example, they said that. They always say in old traditions, the 12 disciples. Why does everybody have 12? <laughs> Why not 13? Why not 10? They're traveling around the country where they always 12. Surely if they started here 12, maybe a year later they, they would be 14. Why did they? Well, maybe. Maybe they were 14, they're 15. But you have to understand. Why did they say the 12 disciples? Because it's the secret quality behind the number 12 that explains the mission and the movement of the disciples is all in the secret behind the number 12. Doesn't really necessarily mean that they were like that. When they spoke of the seven planets, and then you start discovering there are more than seven planets, oh, it's the end of the world, you know. The ancients didn't understand what they were saying. But I'm sure that when they said seven planets, I mean, if they knew so many thousands of years ago that the planet Sirius had a twin star that was of minute size revolving around it that we only discovered lately, and you go to the Dogon tribes in Africa, or, you know, and all that, and they all know that. So th th this is, I mean, this is here understanding when in the ancient scripts they speak, they put numerical things, there are secrets behind every time they put a number. So 
Now, we go to here. Just, this is the diagram, you all know, you have it. But I've just added two things here. Dowsing mental radiesthesia and physical radiesthesia. Physical radiesthesia happens here. You see, the brain isn't necessarily compartmentalized like that. I'm just putting stages that we different activities in the brain. They could happen simultaneously, but they are different activities. So here, I have physical radiesthesia is when the first impulse comes into the nerve, it either excites it or comes somewhere there, if there's an effect on the nerve, and then the brain produces qualitative scales. Those qualitative scales will end up somewhere afterwards, the meaning level, I mean the qualitative scales from sound, color, uh, touch, and all them, they end up in the meaning level of the brain, and then in the meaning level of the brain you get meaning. So in mental radiesthesia, you have a question. Question has a meaning. Unless you're an expert at meaningless questions, I don't know. <laughs> yes, but I, I hope your questions have meanings. If they have meanings, that means they're beyond this level here. That means here. So this is where mental radiesthesia happens, and this is where uh, physical radiesthesia happens. Okay? It, Okay, now we have some pitfalls in French radiesthesia. But to understand that, because of the whole historical thing we went through, when was harmonics introduced, when was that introduced, all that, you would understand, for example, that uh, French radiesthesia was introduced when. Uh, at that time, uh, the harmonics books, the first discovery of, rediscovery of harmonics was at the same time as French anesthesia. But it was in German, written in German, where those people was, were in French. And probably French anesthesia started even a few years earlier. The, the, I'm speaking about the, the school of, uh, the physical school. So, you find in some of the books this mixing up between quality and quantity in both French and German radiesthesia. You will find, for example, you will read uh, the, the negative green is the shortest wavelength in the universe, the most penetrative and shortest wavelength in the universe. Now, it cannot be in radiesthesia you are not detecting a wavelength because even in electricity we know now we know in biogeometry that we're speaking about qualitative scales through harmonics. When harmonics comes in, the world changes. You see? So now, and you will find so many scientists on the net following up on this first sentence of negative green being the shortest thing. And if you go on the net, many scientists say they know they know it. They have discovered it. It is this radiation with this frequency, I don't know where. The other one says it's this frequency. And everybody pretends he has the frequency of vertical negative green. And, you know, I, I had a discussion once with a scientist who was supposed to be one very important figure in, in lots of sciences and trying to in the energy sciences and all that. And he, he's very quantitative school. He comes with his computers and said, and then he comes and tells me, you know, uh, you don't know what you're speaking about uh, when you speak about negative green and things like that. So uh, I tell him why. I mean, I know what negative green is. So I told him, well, look, when I learned about negative green and, and all that, there was no books on the market for you to know, and you were probably not born yet. So, yeah, so, yeah, so he said, no, no, you do not understand. I can explain to you. Can you give me five minutes on the computer, please? He goes into showing graphs and calculations and things and all that, and how 
he came to the frequency to find the frequency of horizontal negative green. Uh, I mean vertical negative green. So I said, okay, if you think that's it, all I can tell you is you're wrong. <laughs> I can't tell you more than that. He says, well, that means you don't know what negative green, because if, you're, if you don't want to tell me where I'm wrong and what it really is, then you don't know it yourself. I said, okay, consider I don't know it. Consider it that way. Why won't you tell me? I said, well, you would have to go through by geometry, learn something and all that, and before you know what really uh, this is. And it wasn't that I didn't want to tell him, but I mean, I wasn't going to go through all, all the stuff that we're doing to somebody who just thinks he has it, you know. And so you find that everywhere. Many, many people are going to tell you. You find that in many, many books of radiesthesia, people assuming because they're speaking frequencies. And this is a, a big problem. Uh, and here, color scales, one should understand, even if they were a form of categorization, they are still not quantitative. The word categorization in itself, the word law of similarities in itself suggests that they were scales of quality because you're using it beyond the color scales. But at that time it was difficult. At that time, how did they build the French anesthesia on color scales? You took your pendulum and you adjusted it on a red color, for example. And then you took that and tested many things out there. And you would say that those things resonate to the red color, so they follow the law of similarities. As you categorize them according to the law of similarities. In itself, this is very correct and it's the basis of qualitative science. But if you have no notion of a qualitative science, then you tend to always translate it to something quantitative. You see? So, now here, for example, if you say the ultraviolet quality has a shorter wavelength than the red, when you're speaking about qualitative scales, forget about the wavelength. Because it's a repetitive a cycle like music, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, re, mi, fa, sol, si, a, si, a, but they're just different qualities. Nothing is shorter and nothing is longer. It's just different qualities. Because you can get any, the quality on any wavelength, see. So this is the controversy. You, once you're clear about that, and you read a sentence that doesn't follow that, you understand uh, that, uh, okay, I take that and leave that. You know, you take what is good for you. And now, the vertical component of wave is harmful, while horizontal is beneficent. This is only partly true because uh, they have to say that when Shomari killed himself with vertical negative green. Now, why are we saying partly true? Okay, it is true that most types of vertical negative green are harmful. Even if there are some bands in there, even if it's not true, if there are, there's a good band and a bad band and so on. Well, I assume those people would have known the good bands from the bad bands and I'll show you why because I, I have one of the very advanced instruments that has all that, but why can they do it? Because the normal person learning radiesthesia when they gave up physical radiesthesia wouldn't be able to differentiate that and he'd end up, I mean, if Shomari with all his knowledge and Belizal and all that, they fell victims to that. Maybe a, a slight wrong adjustment of one of the bands or something and so that's why uh, this is only partly true, but now uh, l let's 
take a few examples. I didn't go into them, but you knew them all along. The pyramid angle. You know, the, the chamber is not under the apex, it's not centered. It says a few degrees off like that. And that angle, an L calls that angle, uh, some call it the pi, pi angle, some call it omega. So there are vertical angles like that off the, the, the center that have been used in the ancient monuments. So that means that this, is, this angle would be just a few degrees off the center that would, it's right in the middle of negative green, of vertical negative green. But it's very beneficent angle. An L actually treated cancer and tuberculosis with two. One of them was very similar to the angle pi, the pi ray, and the other was on the other side of the center, a couple of degrees too, that he used to treat tuberculosis. But then this was very tricky because if he got it with the pyramid or with the hemisphere, he actually, he would get a sample of the person. And he would see the exact distance of that point from the center, from the apex. And then, if it was a pyramid or a hemisphere, he would still try to place that little deflection in a certain direction. And then, now, you have your hemisphere, you know the point in there, but now I want just the ray coming out of that point. How can I take that out when I have all the rest coming up like that? So because it was, you're prone to make mistakes if you do that, and that's how they kill themselves, you, you would have maybe to bring a string, put it in that hole, take it out on the side from under, and then bring it and put it on the sample of the purse. But it's, it's a very tricky thing. Now, NL tried that. He did it, successfully treated some case of cancer tuberculosis. But one of the things he said, and that explains maybe Shomari's death, he said, the moment I did this and placed it on the sample, the whole room became full of negative green. So he had to go out of the room. That means all the other bands came out in the room. You got what you needed, but you saturated the whole room. So he had to sort of air the room and clean it afterwards and all that. So of course, people would be afraid to tell you that there are many good bands in the, negative, in the vertical negative green or in, in the vertical colors to begin with. Now, I gave you uh, a list or you're going to get it. And this list is about, it has disks put in a vertical position so that the polarizers could give vertical negative green. And I showed you on the disk, it's marked several calibrations. I give you maybe 10 or 12 calibrations on the disk that would give you BG3 out of the disk whether you put it in horizontal position or in vertical position. So now you could have a, 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 a vertical, uh, for example, red, giving you with the red BG3, you could have that. So you're getting that, and we're going to work with that in, in, in the next few days. I mean, I'm, go I'm going into all those things, not because I want to find fault with other systems of radiesthesia. No. That would be wrong, I mean, because we build what we build on their shoulders. And future generations are probably going to change a lot of what we're doing and make biogeometry so much better. So here, it is just that we want to go further. Now, if you take an example, in physics, I tell you that uh, the observer 
should always be out of the experiment, so it has to be objective. To be objective, the subject should be out of it. We are taught that at school. But at that same period that they are teaching that, quantum physics was out there. We said that the subject is part of the experiment and there is no way of separate. There is no experiment without the user being a component of the experiment. But then that destroys the whole concept of placebo effect, even today. Everyone thinks placebo effect, placebo effect. There is no way, according to quantum physics, but it, yes, but quantum physics is a micro vibratory level. So it has a certain level where its laws are evident. On a higher level, then normal physics works. Yes, but the molecular level or the atomic level, from the vibration point of view, exists in our body in every cell. <laughs> so they're in each other. It's not one, this is a level and this is a level, you see. So sometimes there are truths in here that are against truths in here, but we should have the wisdom of having to know when to use what. So this is, uh, now the instruments here, some of the French instruments have uh, hemispheres inside them. Four hemispheres like the uh, universal pendulum of Chomery has hemispheres inside it. And some others, s s some many other companies use the same principle, doing their own pendulums and putting the hemispheres inside to polarize it. <coughs> now, polarizing with four hemispheres gives you vertical negative green. So if you're charging and people, this pendulum in the beginning, it was very popular for charging things. Of course, with vertical negative green, you charge things much quicker, but you charge them with vertical negative green. So here, one should be aware of this, one of the, this, one of the early pendulums charges with vertical negative green. Now, to show that many vertical angles can be beneficial, just look at the virtual cone. The virtual cone works with vertical angles, okay? Some of them are good and some of them are bad. One adjustment gives you a horizontal, another adjustment, just a millimeter off will give you verticals. But that means not everything vertical is good or bad, you have both. Now, the direction of pendulum rotation gives charging or discharging. Basics in radiesthesia, you turn the pendulum right, charges, Pendulum left, discharges. Okay, these are very basic principles. But I'm going to go. Uh, I'll explain that a bit later when we go into the brain shapes. But I'll just tell you one thing. When you turn your pendulum something to the right, it will charge. When you turn it to the left, it will not charge, it will discharge for a short period and then it will charge. The charge will come out even if you stop the pendulum. You turn it three times and stop, wait a minute, the charge will come out. Why? Because left turning charges in time. And we did many experiments with this, but it seems most of us have forgotten them. Five years ago, in the first special topics in Asheville, when we were uh, walking in the room, doing a, a test uh, uh, research with compression waves. Remember, I put a person and the other person passes behind him. If he's on your left, what happens? On your right, what happens? And turning and all that. So I'm going to go to that point and even show you how to hold your dial and how to put a certain uh,
color quality on it, and how to turn it in such a way to put a charge in the future, not now, and how to turn it another way to put a charge in the past, and then how to put it in the present. So when I say this is, we're not proving something wrong that right is right and left. It's at, at the present moment, at this second, okay, the right, you see the charge, the left, you won't see it. But in a holistic, once you take the time-space concept, once you go into the fourth dimension of time, then it's not true anymore. But it's good to know it. So I keep repeating again. It's not that when we tell you in our courses in the beginning, this way it does that and this way it does that, we're not contradicting ourselves at the moment. No, we're just showing a deeper knowledge of something. See? And although we practiced it, although we, we did some exercises with that five years ago, but we didn't stress on it in this point because there's no need to mix people. People are read already, as we've seen many take our courses and then uh, they don't practice at all. Some of them practice, some of them don't. Those who don't practice come and have lots of problems. Here, people who don't practice are going to have lots of problems when they measure, they look at their neighbor and see how, how do I hold this, how do I do that. So there's no need to go and complicate things with people even more. But we're now going to go deeper into subplanes. So there comes a point where you have no choice. See, yeah, you're going into subplanes. Now, these are the known pendulums of French radiesthesia. You see, you know, you know those. That's the virtual cone. That is the reversal cone. That's the Turin pendulum with the two uh, needles here. There's another one. I didn't put the picture here. Uh, there's another one with 16 faces here. Uh, virtual cone with 16 faces. Uh, and. It's a, a pendulum that, uh, no, I'm sorry, it has eight faces, not 16. Uh, there's another one that has 16, I'm going to show. It's called the infrared ult ultraviolet uh, pendulum, or the negative green pendulum, sometimes they call it. You could actually uh, measure 64 different uh, adjustments of negative green with it. And there comes a table with it showing you, for example, a cavity in the ground would be on a different negative green calibration than, for example, uh, a, a crack. A crack, you'd have to do this adjustment and then have underground cracks. But cavities, you'd have to have this adjustment. Or uh, some underground streams, you'd have to go this. Uh, lung cancer, you can find it if you adjust this adjustment of negative green. But colon cancer would be the other adjustment of negative green. So he has a table of 64 uh, levels of negative green. Uh, the picture of that pendulum is in his book. So, but I'm not sure if, if the tables are there. But I think the picture is in Shomri's book. So now I'm going to show you a pendulum, their last uh, great work, their last pendulum that was never available for sale. And so th this is their pendulum. It has so many, it has nothing, it doesn't have hemispheres inside it. See how many faces it has here. This is the one that has 16 faces and I'll show you different pictures. And then here, at this advanced level, uh, they're writing the magnetic and the uh, electric. You see, in the convective, when I first saw this, I was testing and testing, trying to find why, until I found that on one side it would give you electric, on the other side it would give you uh, magnetic. 
But then, when I got the more advanced pendulums, I actually found that it was written. It was written in there. So that means they knew it. But they didn't put it in their pendulums, in their virtual comp pendulum, because they didn't want people uh, to start turning this around and start measuring vertically. But this pendulum, this is their own handwriting, which shows that they knew exactly why they did this. Now, this one, this part up there, turns. You, you know, you have one adjustment here is the, this line. Adjust to this line, this is the neutral thing. And then every color has all those bands here. So they're actually different angle, vertical angles for every one color. And then you see, then you can turn the disk in, in different directions on testing on certain colors. So here this, now the disk is on the infrared here and you have all the different bands here. And then this one, you can turn it so many rotations. So it tells you two rotations, three rotations. You can turn this one and you can also make a second adjustment with the line on the color. So you can adjust this on the color. You can adjust the line here on the color. And and see up here, once this is on a screw. So once you rotate it up like this, you can fix it by pushing the pin down. And there are holes in here because you have several levels. So I'll show you. Wait, how? No. Yeah. Well, this is. I don't have the rest of the pictures here. Maybe you can see the holes inside. No, I don't have them here. But th there are holes in there. You see, there are holes inside there. Above each one of those colors, there's a hole. And so when you put the pin up there, you can fix it to the hole. So you can turn these three rotations up and fix it here. OK. So the two things that we have in French radiesthesia, or the three things, is the revival of physical radiesthesia of the ancients. In, it gives us. A, certainly an important revival, the color scales in mental and physical methods, and the healing applications. The cons, as far as we're concerned, no concept of quality versus quantity, no concept of harmonics. And uh, of course, the other thing is that French radicesia and German radicesia don't have the connection to the center, which is BD3, which I think is very important in uh, biogeometry. Now we go to German radiesthesia. German radiesthesia, um, instead of going through the history of all of German radiesthesia, because the ancient history of German radiesthesia would be very similar to the French one. But I'm going to uh, modern radiesthesia here. This is the Ludelin antenna. Helmut Ludelin uh, is a friend of mine from Germany, and he is the one who devised this is the H3. Uh, Ludelin antenna, and this one is a, a French version done in France. Now, Lescher made what you call the double antenna. You, you know, an antenna that goes like this, comes back from the m microwave uh, applications so that he, he makes standing waves. Now, the Lescher, I see you have yours with you. That's the French one, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris had the French one, and you can adjust here. They took the principles, and you can adjust the standing wave by here, this bridge that you have. Anywhere you pull down the bridge and you put it here, for example, that means the standing wave will come here. So that would be the standing wave would be only that big. You make so you can decide on the length of the wave that you capped. And the moment you cap the standing wave, show them, Chris, stand up and show them. 
it will hit at you. You hold it. Well, injury, I can't use it. Well, just move it to show them the direct. Just, just move it. Okay, see, it will. Whenever you have that wavelength in front of that wavelength, so it will. It will. <laughs> okay, so now this is very advanced system of radiesthesia, and they have a huge body of work. They have tables of about 4,000 adjustments. Okay. The German radiesthesia has very, very advanced earth grid line research and has lesser antenna, a huge body of calibration tables for the lesser antenna. The, the French one that this has has a bit less tables than Ludelin, but the tables work on both anyhow. Now, the cons here is the whole quantitative paradigm. The, the, the whole language, when, you, when you're reading about it in the books, the whole language, you, you see its origin very much. It speaks about wavelength and frequency. So the whole language of this, of the lesser antenna, is a quantitative language. And that is, okay, you can discuss with them, they measure, let's say they measure one thing. And you find that, for example, for every measurement, you will find that in their table, that it happens, of course, every wavelength happens at multiple lengths there. You can get water on this wavelength, but on this wavelength, and so on. Well, okay, doesn't this give light? They tell yes, because it's, they look at it from the quantitative aspect. Because the wavelength, of course, double the wavelength also works for water. Triple the wavelength works for water. Okay, but take just one more step, and you're into the nation notion of harmonics. And another step, and you're into the energy quality. Well, they didn't take that step. So now, you see, the wavelengths are in reality units in a repetitive qualitative scale. Although they are wavelengths, they are still no different from, the wavelength here is no different from a color, from a musical note. It is a unit in a qualitative scale. That's how we should understand it. But describing it doesn't make the lesser antenna less of an instrument or more of an instrument. It's just the way of in interpreting it if you want to go further. But that doesn't make it less of an instrument. So, now we come to biogeometry. Um, so, so the cornerstone, of course, in biogeometry, I don't have to introduce, is the BG3. Because that is the cornerstone of all ancient sciences. Without BG3, you have a lame science. You know, without the connection to divinity, you are nowhere. And so BG3, in reality, is a mission, is a spiritual mission. Every measurement you do with BG3, you're changing the environment, you're changing yourself with every BG3 measurement. That's why we say make for every one measurement on a grid line, you have to have at least four measurements of BG3 per day if you do that. Why? Four, four more times. BG3, because your system has to be calibrated to BG3. If you make more grid lines than BG3, you're slowly shifting the calibration of your body. You become better at detecting grid lines, but also better at attracting their harmful energy into your system. So, then, by geometry here, you see, we restore the ancient scientific paradigm of quality. This is important for us. You know, uh, that means the ancient way of looking at the universe as unity. The whole universe is a whole harmonic system. So now we're looking at the whole symphony. Now, 
bridging science and spirituality because the only way to bridge science and spirituality is not by writing a chapter on science and a chapter on spirituality and putting them in the same book. <laughs> yeah, everybody does that and say they're bridging. No, you must say, take the attributes of one and put it in the other so that they can interact, they can communicate. So f first of all, for spirituality, we should, spirituality should have practical applications. We should have a, a practical science so that we take a step towards science. Now once you have practicality, so once you say this is an energy that can be stored, that can be radiated, that can be done, okay, we're speaking science now, we're taking a step towards science. Now the opposite direction, if we develop any product of modern science, we're going to say, we're going to put the human subtle energy factor as one of the criteria of the product. The, pro the product should address my subtle energy levels to make me better. Then already we're bridging between both. If you don't do that, bridging is just talk. You have to, and that's one of the goals of biogeometry, is this bridging. And then when I say uh, a way of spiritual evolution, because biogeometry, to reach the public, you make solutions to everyday problems that they cannot do otherwise. Like with the chicken without antibiotics, electrosensitivity or whatever, give them solutions to their problems. This is the only way you can sneak in spirituality through the back door. <laughs> yeah. To, uh, unfortunately, the, today's mind thinks of practicality. Today's mind does not think of spirituality. It has to be practical. It has to have economic uh, benefits. You see, when I, I, I do uh, the chicken project and all that, if I make shorten the cycle with one day, or increase the weight a bit, uh, money. So th that's how it works today. And the universal centering energy quality, the BG3, is universally applicable, means that you come to understand that your basic solution to any problem is raising the amount of BG3. And then, of course, there's fine-tuning, you can tailor it with this, fine-tuning it with that, uh, and things like that. Like we, for example, with electricity, you have the strip, and then you have the 16, okay, but then we fine-tune it by putting a 9. So a strip with 9 and 16, or with water, a strip with 16 and 11. But the basic one is the 16. If you put the 9 alone without the 16, you, you have problem. It works at certain times, then. Uh, it can overwork and underwork. You know, there's no balance if you put uh, any of the non-BG3 numbers without a BG3 uh, number. So, okay. Here we have the dial pendulums are the most accurate pendulums that exist today because they are very easy to calibrate to any uh, amount of precision. I mean, the dial itself, I can have a dial of 180, I can have a dial of 360, I can have a dial of 720. Depending on what I am measuring, I can have any type of dial. I can, just by changing the dial, I can go into more and more detail in my measurement. That's very simple horizontal dials, vertical dials, so they're the most accurate pendulums. Now, when I say uh, the biogeometry radiesthesia, pe people sometimes ask me, and we're thinking about that, if this is the most accurate pendulum, then 
why shouldn't we make it available to all housing societies? I mean, why shouldn't everybody be able to use it? We're planning to do that, but remember, housing societies have no notion of biogeometry. That means, while our goal is creating BG3, so I keep teaching you of how to detect it, how to produce it, how to uh, emphasize how to do, to, to radiate it, and all. That's our main purpose. But if you're going to give that pendulum to dowsing societies who do not have our paradigm, they would be using it mainly for as a tool of detection. As a tool of detection, you would need to give them a table with at least a thousand measurements so that they can use it to detect things. Otherwise, they tell you, I mean, I use the lesser antenna, I can detect copper, I can detect zinc, I can detect, I don't know this, I can detect that. Okay, if you give me your pendulum, give me a table for all those things. I want to detect selenium, I want to detect that. And then, if you tell them, no, I mean, this is not our paradigm, we're more into BG3, they tell you, BG3 is useless for me, I want to detect. Yeah, I want to detect my, the things that everybody detects with a disease and table. So to give that, it's fairly easy to, to put those tables to sort of translate them into degrees. It's fairly easy. Uh, but it would take some work. And we're discussing, we might do uh, a, a little booklet with all the tables of all the adjustments you can make on the horizontal pendulum or the vertical pendulum, but in this case with it will come maybe a larger disk with more degrees in there. Now, of course, what differentiates biogeometry from everything else in, in, is that biogeometry is a multidimensional system. Any system today that is not multidimensional is not of much use. BG3 is a multidimensional portal to begin with. Because you know BG3 is the secret power spot. The secret power spot by the ancients is the portal. The portal where you interacted with uh, angelic entities, with things like that, where you had communications uh, from there. So it was the sacred power spots that became the sacred power spots. They became, uh, let's say, the soul of the whole community, you see. So th th they used to call, when they put them in here, there, on the power spot, they used to refer to this place as the spirit of place. Because th to them, there was a spirit there. This was the spirit of the community. So it was alive because it interacted when they went there, interacted with their subconscious levels on all higher levels. So they would seek it for advice. They would seek it for oracles and things like that. So, and with enough interaction with the community, sometimes those huge stones would vibrate to give answers, you know. So, so you'd get feeling as if they were alive. Now, this multidimensionality is very, very important, not just from a mystical point of view and all that, but today, if you think, ask yourself a very simple question. How did we go to a town, an area like Hamburg, and manage to take away the harmful effects of electromagnetic radiation from the people without removing the sources? This sounds very illogical, it's against all logic. You want to remove the effect, remove the source. And that's what actually how the people reacted when the government told them, we're not removing the sources, we're bringing a scientist from Egypt, even though they said he has the highest degrees from our universities in Switzerland and all that. Still, the moment they said he's going to cancel all the effects without removing things, or they started saying, this is magic, this is not possible, this is that, you know, it's because the logical thing says cause-effect. 
but now in a multidimensional system. Where is the effect located in your system? When you say, I feel, I feel stress, that means something is happening on your emotional level. I become aware of stress, of electricity. Something is happening where? On your mental level. So if I don't address the emotional and mental levels, I, I don't understand the problem at all. So if electricity ca ca has the effect of making you, uh, in a way, uh, for example, uh, you can't see life in a positive way. It changes your whole mental attitude. It weakens your will. It weakens your pleasure of life and things like that. These are all psychological things. So are, are the mental, emotional aspects more important than the physical or the opposite? Because some people could say, no, of course, the physical problem has triggered those two. Some other people tell you, no, the psychosomatic is more important. Well, in any case, we're here to study it. In any case, with our, by jump, you have to study it. So, in reality, by geometry has harmonized the higher levels. It has harmonized the emotional and mental without changing the physical. So the physical is still there. It goes into your emotional system. Instead of feeling stress, by geometry harmonizes that system. Instead of being aware of the problem, is harmonized by by jump. So what happens at the end? It's as if that source doesn't exist to you. It does. Yeah. So it goes through your body. Now this is very difficult for people to comprehend if they go and measure, and still find that before and after, you have the exact measurements. So they automatically say, this is a placebo effect. The amount of radioactivity or or whatever amount is, is the same exactly. So it must be placebo effect. Well, like we said, placebo means something happening on the mental and emotional. Okay, that's exactly where we work. So that is exactly where we did the changes. And then, when we do the changes on those levels, something seems to happen on all the other levels and changes. So. Without a multidimensional radiesthesia of bijomtri and the multidimensional energy system. That's, I think, why we're here this time to go deeper into multidimensionality of the planes. But without this concept of multidimensionality, uh, you, you can't produce any effect on modern technology because we cannot change the physical uh, aspect of any product. But the physical aspect of any product is only 10%. There's 90% are the higher levels. And if you want, if you tell me the cup in front of me cannot have multiple levels, you think that the cup in front of me has an emotional level? or has a mental level, well, you're going to test that on the ruler in the next two days and discover it for yourself. If it didn't have an emotional level, it wouldn't be able to enter into resonance with your emotional system and store that on the cup so that the next person who holds the cup feels, uh -uh, what did she have, what problems did she have, or is she a person, and all that just from your cup. So, uh, so this is the multidimensionality of bi-geometry. So, at the end, uh, we must say that by geometry uses actually radiesthesia as a tool for its own goals. But by geometry is not radiesthesia. See, we use it for our own goals, but we go further. Our goals are producing results, sneaking spirituality through the back door. With you, I don't have to sneak it to the back door because you're studying by geometry. 
but the people that you interact with, you're sneaking it to the back door when you do somebody's uh, house or somebody's area. You're sneaking it when you give somebody one of those medallions. You're sneaking it into his system. That's what the people in Hamburg told me after a year, because I was very scientific, you know, I was working with the government and all that, and they came and said, look, and th they have something, the Swiss, it is our right to know what kind of energy you have been subjected to. We know it, we know it, but you don't want to admit it. And I said, what do you know? Well, the change that happened to us, to the community, and when the mayor comes and says, you brought peace to our community, and you brought the church back into our hearts, all this doesn't happen like this. But geometry has something to do with spiritual energy. And so I said, well, you discovered that? You think that? I never said that. He said, we didn't discover we know it. We are the subjects here. We know it. So why don't you please explain exactly how biogeometry introduces spiritual energy through biogeometry shapes? It's our right to know that because we are living in it. We want to know. So of course, I explained a bit about biogeometry. The newspapers the next day came out and said, now we know, of course, the Egyptian is using some spiritual force uh, to achieve his results. You, you know? And that's why I didn't have to want to tell them in the beginning. But that's how uh, things are. I think now it's time for the break. Because we are two hours. We take a 10-minute break and uh, come back for another dance. This is... Uh, before we leave for the break, this is just a picture of our multi-dimensional uh, pendulums. We are making a new set of multi-dimensional pendulums because I'm sh sure that many of you would want to go deeper into the system once you've gone through this course. But the, the problem is this one uh, I have here the possibility of dealing with all the planes, but it does not include all the subplanes. So the subplanes, each 12 divisions, or even if I make them seven or three, it, I'd still need many more shapes like those to fit them together.